Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of GLP's 10 Out of 10. And today we have with us Bob Dickinson. Uh, Bob was born in Kent in the United Kingdom, but moved to the US when he was two years old, with a brief stop in Kansas before heading to California, where he's lived ever since. From a fascination of seeing TV productions in action, Bob set out on his career. And after working in a film rental company, Bob got his big break into the industry when gaffer Doug Pantek got him into the union. From there, it wasn't long before Bob started forging his own way in the world of lighting design and forging long lasting relationships. His breakthrough show was Solid Gold, where his lighting design earned him his first Emmy Award at the age of 29. In 1990, Bob formed the company Full Flood, a Los Angeles based consortium of designers specialized in television and live events. Bob has lit more award shows than I've had hot dinners. From the Emmys, the Grammys, the Oscars, the Tonys, the Golden Globes, the ESPYs, the BET Awards, the Billboard Awards, the Country Music Association Awards, the Kids' Choice Awards, the American Music Awards, and on and on the list continues. It's just absolutely incredible. His television specials include 13 Super Bowl halftime shows, including the very first one that starred Michael Jackson, the VH1 Divas, Miss USA, Christmas in Washington, David Copperfield, and the Kennedy Center Honors. Large-scale events include the opening and closing ceremonies at the Olympic Games in Atlanta in 1996, in Salt Lake City in 2002, in Athens in 2004, and in Vancouver in 2010. There's also been plenty of work on music events and adaptations for the screen with clients that include Neil Diamond, Willie Nelson, Celine Dion, Ricky Martin, Lionel Richie, and the iconic We Are The World. Now, if I've done my math correctly, Bob has received an incredible 67 Emmy Award nominations and winning on 21 of those occasions. That's in addition to an Ace Award, a Knight of Illumination Sword, and an honorary doctorate from Carnegie, I'm oh, sorry, an honorary doctorate of fine arts from Carnegie Mellon University. Welcome, Bob Dickinson. Thank you, thank you. And I just have a question for you. Will you be my agent? <laughs> that's right. that's, I mean, that's it's, fantastic. Thank you. It's it's immense. It's just incredible. Uh, and of course, we can see some of those some of those awards behind you. Uh, it's just. <laughs> I framed it this way. I, I must admit. <laughs> <Yeah, right. laughs> it's just incredible. And there was there was one other fact that uh, I, I saw when I was doing the research for this. Uh, and, and it was a few years old, so I couldn't quite get it up to date, but it said that you'd already had 1,500 on-screen credits on television, uh, which, again, just, just a phenomenal number. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Could and I, that, that is an old figure, um, and I'm sure it's approaching 2,000. But, you know, it's uh, not about the on-screen credit. It's about the on-screen work. <laughs> and oh, right. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Wow, it's but it's just yeah, it's just absolutely amazing all the stuff you've done. So I'm thoroughly looking forward to uh, to this now and going through our through our ten questions. Um, if we if we pick off our first one, go right back towards you know the beginning of your career. What was your first show as a lighting designer? Um, in high school, I was one of those irritating theater geeks that was on the <laughs> stage crew. Mm. And uh, I even tried acting and I really sucked. <laughs> <laughs> it was just it wasn't no wasn't cut out for um, you. Yeah. And and uh, so I did I was on the stage crew and I got the chance to light the uh, Mad Woman of Shio, which is a kind of aggressive play for high school students to be doing. Mm. And um, it was my my show and Instead of doing an in one front of I mean front of stage wash that mm -hmm. would cover everything, I decided I want to be tricky and do specific you know specific uh, uh, moments. Um, and so we start the show, and mm -hmm. out walks this high school actress playing the Mad Woman, and she starts her soliloquy, and the key light the 1930s vintage. Lico <laughs> burned out the bulb and she went black and I had no backup. Oh no. And, and she just finished <laughs> and, and the, the play went on, but it was, 
not necessarily a good introduction. Yeah, well. <laughs> but I, I, in television, mm. the, the first big opportunity I got was Don Kirshner's rock concert. You know, everyone knows Ricky Kirshner today, the celebrated producer mm. and uh, fantastic, you know, career he's had. But his father produced a show in which he did Top of the Pops. Okay. And um, I worked as the gaffer for Jeff Engel, who is a fine lighting designer, still around and still lighting, I might add. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so at a last second, Jeff gets a phone call and asking him to go to Hawaii for two weeks to do a special. I don't know, Don Ho special or something. I have no idea. Okay. And so Jeff is not going to turn down a, a, you know, 10 days in Hawaii for a week <laughs> with Don Kirshner. And so he calls up the producer and uh, says, you know, I'm got Tom Champ, a fine lighting designer in the day, but he was, I think, 80 years old at the time that this occurred <laughs> in late, or in, yeah, mid to late 70s. And, um, and Lou Horvitz, who is a young, dynamic, and um, rather opinionated, well just justified, mm. uh, uh, director said, F that. I'm not going to have Tommy Champ light my show with uh, the the police on stage. And we were supposed to light the police that week. Okay. Or, uh, the police were on the show that week. Oh. And so uh, it was like, you know, wow. Um, <laughs> and uh, so Lou goes, I want Bob, the gaffer, to do it. Okay. And so I get this phone call from Lou saying, you better not F up. But I just went and put myself on the line and you're going to light the show next week. Well, I had been to Las Vegas the prior week and had gone to a smoke filled dome at the Aladdin to see Fleetwood Mac. And it was not smoke filled because they were putting, you know, anything in the air. It was just weed. <laughs> this whole place was dense with weed. But uh, they had a couple of backlight follow spots. And I just was blown away with how dynamic those beams of light were that were moving around following different members. And, and I thought, well, I'm going to be doing rock concert, my big opportunity. I'll ask if we can put smoke in the air and put a couple of backlight follow spots up. Well, didn't go over well, money, money, money. But Lou went to bat for me and said, this is what we're going to do. So... We ended up putting smoke in the air, that toxic cookie stuff they used to burn. Yeah. And I got two backlight follow spots. Awesome. It wow. was like I had just invented the wheel. It was <laughs> like the, the the reception by even the the talent was this is unlike any television on the air. Wow. And boom, Don Kirshen's rock concert was mine, and it started my career in in music and event television with uh, that one decision by Jeff Engel to go to Hawaii and get a tan. Wow. Wow. That's fantastic. And, and the rest is history from there. That's yeah. Brilliant. A lot of history. <laughs> right. right. A lot of things since. Yeah. That's my absolutely fantastic. Wow. Does it now, I, I, I have read that you say um, you like to take risks when you're doing your lighting and, and you don't always use, you know, you, you use key light appropriately, uh, uh, but you, you don't always use it necessarily traditionally. Now, would, would part of that come from your very first experience in high school when it, you learned to live without key light all of a sudden? <laughs> well, you know, looking back on it, if I had had even a, a cross light, you know, a smoke boom pocket, um, set of Lico's to bring on, it would have been really interesting. It would have been actually better than the flat front light that I had. But um, no, I didn't have any of that. Um, <laughs> the, the one thing that I will say, though, that um, the Don Kirshner e experiment mm. led me to kind of trust my instincts. And um, over the years, I, you know, been presented with problems and instead of 
doing what and frequently going against like the network and even the producers that mm. do not want to take big risks and just want to get a nice bright image home. Um, but I had producers that indulged me. And um, there was one time on the Oscars, this is a jumping forward, um, Bruce Springsteen was on the Oscars and he was mm. going to do the streets of Philadelphia and okay. he did not do television. They had never done the Oscars, but he was nominated. And so he, um, he came on the show and Roy Christopher, brilliant designer, had this very low key set behind him. Okay. And they came out and rehearsed once and then um, John Landau, his manager, came back and said, Bruce loves everything, cam work and everything else, but mm. he just cannot stand having scenery behind him. And okay. They're like, okay, what are we going to have? He says, Bruce likes lights. So <laughs> I trundled out a bunch of pan spots and put them on the floor in a semicircle around him and put a bunch of smoke in the air and did the, you know, Battle of Britain thing. With Great. Still not a overused technique at that time. Mm. Um, but <clears throat> I thought, you know, this is really interesting. What would really feel good is not just a flat lit face at 3200 degrees Kelvin. Mm. So instead, I used a key light from one of the box booms and um, I used daylight 6,000 degree Kelvin okay. uh, uncorrected on it. Right. It was a home run. I <laughs> mean, it was so appropriate to the subject matter. So, and fortunately, because Bruce liked it so much, they, uh, we were able to, uh, we, they stuck with it. Right. And the producers allowed me to do it. I don't know if the producers at the time it was uh, Gil Cates. I don't know if they would have indulged me in mm. doing that. Um, but when the talent responds, and we all know the talent ruin, rules the industry, you know. The, right, yes. If the talent happy, then you almost can do anything. Mm. And uh, when Bruce loved it, it was like, okay, that's what we're gonna put on the air, so. Right, that was it, decision was made. Yep. Fantastic. yep. That's absolutely brilliant, that's brilliant. That's, and that just shows, like you say, you know, go uh, take risks, uh, trust, your, trust your gut feeling. It, it, it works. Yeah. Um, and, you know, try to interpret the moment. Mm. You know, don't, don't build. And we all see over cueing. It's like over color, over cueing. It's like, yeah, color and stuff gets poured on visuals like ketchup. Right. It's, it's just, <laughs> oh, there's all this color and all these cues. And, yeah. but, um, if you choose your battles, you can interpret the music and do it rather effectively. Um, and, you know, that is when we really do our job. It's yes. not when we're shining on our own, but we're actually supporting the content, which mm. is really important. Yes, absolutely. That's, the, that's what it's being broadcast for at the end of the day. So. Yeah. Um, obviously, I mean, there's, you've done so, so many things across the years, and, and I'm sure the majority of them have gone absolutely smoothly and absolutely flawlessly. But, uh, but I'm betting there might be a couple of times when things didn't quite go according to plan. Uh, do you have any kind of, you know, spinal tap memories where, where it wasn't quite as it should have turned out? It's almost every show, to be honest with <laughs> you. <laughs> it never works out. And, you know, that cue you thought was going to be brilliant ends up blinding the camera at the wrong time. And yeah, it just never works out. Yeah. But uh, no, there, there was one instance that really was my spinal tap moment. Okay. And that was the first year I got the Oscars. And here I was, a young designer, mm. got the opportunity of a career because they had always used ABC lighting directors to light the Oscars. Okay. It's a union thing and plus a financial thing. And for whatever reason, I end up being brought in by the director and the production designer, Roy Christopher, and mm -hmm. the director, uh, Marty Pacetta, um, had worked with me and they both said, we should just try Bob because what we're getting from the ABC lighting director is just unacceptable. Okay. And um, so, 
I think, well, you know, here's my big opportunity. Mm. And my gut said, we're ready to move on. And the Oscars hung like 2000 lights, maybe more every year. Um, and it was, you know, it was a time when we lit, key lit at like 75 foot can. I mean, it was a lot of foot candles on stage right. compared <laughs> to today. Maybe a hundred, you know, it was a lot of foot candles. Um, yeah, but, you know, I thought this, this is an opportunity here to do something different. Right. And my success on Solid Gold, which I got an Emmy nomination for, mm. I lost the first time I was nominated, but um, <clears throat> I, um, I had success with smoke. And so I thought, you know, maybe we'll try to get some smoke on the air. And, oh, the Oscars, the talent, the, but, um, but I thought 2000 lights you know, plus, mm. it's, so lugubrious and so heavy right and uh plus roy had overbuilt almost that year the show so the bays were really not as plentiful as i would have liked hmm. so but i had success with these moving lights i was using on solid gold uh, the morpheus panna spots okay yep and um <laughs> so that year that Morpheus also came out with what they call the Pana Beam, mm. which was an incandescent source and a parabolic lens um, and with a scroller. And it pan tilted, obviously, and dimmed. But, um, and so I put, I just thought, thought why not hang like almost 100% on the stage moving sources? Well, they couldn't, they didn't have the inventory, but we did hang like, you know, 200, I think. Um, moving sources okay and over the course of the rehearsal i built the show on the moving sources i had some backlight specials and some other stuff but boom it was like the show and i was like a rock star to the people at the academy they like the show looks so great and so we're um we're uh finishing up dress rehearsal day of show Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden all the lights tilt up and pan stage right boom turn themselves off oh. and it's like okay it, uh, john richardson who owned morpheus was also operating said mm -hmm. john is everything okay and we're fine we're fine and they finish rehearsal out and, and what's wrong bob and uh, uh, right. but we uh, yeah <laughs> tap dancing right and so i go rushing out to the board the minute rehearsal's over and there is john richardson and a couple of his guys mm. and the top of the klegel performer too and all you young kids can look that up but this is an ancient ancient uh board mm. and it in fact its data was stored on a cassette tape right and if you weren't careful you put in the cassette tape and have you know like the Rolling Stones <laughs> feeding information to the lights, but they, um, it, and it, it had just, a, it had a, a small keyboard. It wasn't, you know, it mm. was very, very limited and very difficult to, to program. And um, so I go out there and they got a bunch of soldering irons and stuff in the board and, you know, they're, and uh, they, you know, I'm like, oh my God, I just saw my career, my blossoming career <laughs> before my eyes. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so you one of those puffs of smoke. <laughs> but it turned out that the snake got pulled on and they had snapped the ground in the snake and whatever. And so all hell broke loose, but they replaced the snake and we did the show and I was kind of a hero. Right. Not for fixing the board, but for the <laughs> but for the lights. Wow. Wow. So that was a that was a real close call. That must have been uh, some tense moments there as uh, you know, producers and directors are asking you what's going on. Yeah. There <laughs> <laughs> especially um the director and the production designer who had <laughs> recommended me on the show were like, did we make the biggest mistake of our careers also? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, they're they're going to be in the firing line as well. Wow. Yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. Um, Bob, what would you say is the best piece of advice that anyone's ever given you, either, either professionally or, or otherwise? Um, I was told very early on um, that, and ironically, it was by another lighting designer who I work for, Carl Gibson, and fantastic and significant designer at that time. Um, one of the first people to go outside the networks and he formed his own company and became a, a lighting designer freelance, which didn't exist or hardly existed at the time. Right. And so I, um, uh, I was, you know, started to work for Carl's company and, uh, and who I worked for at the time of the Don Kirshner story. So, right. and uh, I was working actually as sort of a staff gaffer, um, but, uh, you know, I was struggling to make ends meet off of the money I was earning. Mm. Um, and by the way, there wasn't as much freelance work because it was primarily still a network world with network NABIT staffs that, you know, so they, not many producers uh, produce outside of the network envelope or bubble. Right. And um, so I wasn't earning a bunch of money. And mm. Carl Gibson came up to me and probably just to save money for himself, I don't know, um, said, Bob, don't worry about money right now. This is the time in your career where you establish relationships and figure out what you can do and start to trust your aesthetic. But don't necessarily worry about money right now. Mm. Money will come later, but don't worry about money as a young designer. And it actually calmed me down and it turned out to be absolutely accurate advice. Instead of turning down shows or grow, being upset about the amount I was being paid or mm. anything else, I, I encouraged relationships and opportunities where I could actually do my craft. And um, then in the 30s, when I was in my 30s, not the 1930s, but right. 30s, I'm not that old. I was, right, right. Uh, when I was in my 30s, um, it, my career started to blossom. And by the time I hit 40, the money was coming, just as Carl predicted. That, right. you know, I started earning enough money to be able to start putting it away for, you know, later in life. So, mm. yeah, I, that was probably the, the best advice I ever got. Right. I guess that's very much thinking, yeah, thinking about the long term. Uh, and, and, and yeah, exactly. As you say, you know, establishing relationships and, and all that, of those things that are going to be important. Key. That is the key relationships mm -hmm. are what, cause there, we live in a freelance world and we work with a myriad of clients frequently they're the act for live shows or producers in my world, producers and directors, mm -hmm. but those relationships that you establish early in your career um usually can sustain you throughout your career and especially in my case um i made you know i had relationships with younger producers and directors mm. who were doing because i didn't qualify to do you know the really high profile andy williams special or anything right. um i uh you know i was working for younger directors and producers mm. and they as their careers grew, mine grew. And yes. So yeah. Just exactly. the right thing to do. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's very, very sound advice indeed. Um, <clears throat> professionally, what would you say is your proudest achievement so far? Um, okay. It's really hard to do mm. because I've had so many great opportunities, so many wonderful cues. <laughs> So many not so great cues. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've had I've agreed to things with once with Kanye West where I got backed into a corner, and it, he went black on the air. He just would no light on him whatsoever because I was I had no resources to save him. So we opened up the Grammys and or I'm sorry, it's the BET Honors, and mm. here's Kanye West, and then he's gone. And there's only a voice and black on the screen, <laughs> but that was not, that was not the worst. I, did. <laughs> I mean, for the, that was the worst. Um, 
and perhaps <laughs> not the very worst. But, was, uh, but I think the two that are most meaningful to me, mm. um, there are three. Uh, okay. The first was um, uh, the uh, Olympic ceremonies in Athens. Um, it was a very high concept, a Greek production and creative team that really had dynamic and unusual ideas that were visually compelling. Hmm. And um, I was able to really dive into it. And my contribution was not only appreciated, it turned out to be formative to the entire creative process. And Okay. So I felt really proud about the result, but I also felt proud about the process that, mm -hmm. that I was not just the lighting guy that, you know, I was an integral part of some really important creative concepts. And so, yes, uh, but the, uh, mm -hmm. I think the second was the Prince halftime show. And I don't know why stadium shows are <laughs> my favorites, but, um, <laughs> He was in the center of that arena in Miami and, mm. you know, he's do it just, the man did not appear that often and he was kind of a rarity. Yeah. And we are doing the show and they had one of those torrential rains move in that Southern Florida is famous. For. Right. And wow. it was pouring. It was pouring. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I had all these strobes on one of the balcony rails that all just failed and DMX boxes were blown, blown, blown. Uh, but, uh, you know, the show goes on. I well, it turns out when we got to purple rain, of course, on the nose, purple rain, <laughs> <laughs> pervasive color. Right. And of course, he was singing in purple rain. Right. And, the following day, I took off for China to go do a, a, another project there. Hmm. And I was meeting with the Chinese clients, and they were very excited about the halftime show. And they said, uh, how did you make so much rain? <laughs> <laughs> they thought it was an effect. <laughs> You're from Southern Florida. It's like... <laughs> the, uh, the other thing that, that is coming to mind, and it's only because it's recent, hmm was this past um this past election cycle um yeah. when uh biden was to do his inaugural when all the drama involved the pandemic and everything else um mm -hmm. we were actually put out at the lincoln memorial and but there's very strict rules that so you can't actually splash light on the memorial it's very they're, they're, no color, no, no, you know, okay. it's all those rules. Hmm. Um, but, and also because of the pandemic, uh, I opted not to go to Washington. And okay. fortunately for me, they <laughs> set up a, a, they air packed in an entire control booth for me. I, you know, had uh, headsets to every department and to the director, Glenn Weiss, and to, you know, and, Right. I um, was able to talk with my team and I had, you know, yeah, it was just, it was genius. I was right. in my kitchen doing the, the inaugural. <laughs> um, but, and we were very limited. We couldn't do anything. Mm. I mean, and, but with my team, Travis Hagenbuch was the, uh, working with me and he went to, uh, to Washington. Um, we actually were able to light this thing um, these performances in front of the Lincoln Memorial and the, the associated talks and whatever, mm. uh, including Springsteen, uh, <laughs> we were able to light them with very few actually plugged in instruments. And we use battery operated technology and, mm -hmm. and very low light levels. I think we keyed at like 15 foot candles, okay. uh, 150 lux approximately. Yep. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> they, uh, it, it ended up being so meaningful, I guess because of the election and what we had all gone through in the pandemic. And, you know, so it was ended up being very meaningful. Right. But part of it was we got a call that they, that they wanted to honor 
those that had passed because of the pandemic. They wanted a way to symbolize, you know, how dramatic this loss is. Mm. And we tossed around all these ideas like, you know, uh, xenons pointing straight up in the air, you know, each xenon representing so many people and right. bad idea because you never know about atmosphere. Could be a dry, dry night, and then you got no shafts of light there. <laughs> and you know, we talk about scenic ideas and and you know all these things. So we we were examining a bunch of ideas, and uh, Bruce Rogers, the production designer, hmm. um, who's always a good resource for intelligent concepts and design, uh, and I and a few others brainstormed and we came up with the idea of these monoliths that would be just fabric uh, rectangles okay. lit internally mm -hmm. and um, with a warm light. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we, um, we ended up putting in these along the reflecting pool and um, they ended up being probably the most emotional moment for a lot of people mm. when it was uh, indicated that these monoliths represented those that had passed because of the pandemic. And there was a very slow cue uh, that they, they lit up coming toward camera. Right. And, um, yeah, it was, I, I, I felt very proud of my craft and very proud of, you know, what we achieved um, for a really a grieving culture. And so, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And especially, like you said, under the circumstances, you know, obviously tough, uh, uh, tough conditions to work under with, with, with still very much social distancing and, and all of the practicalities in place that, that you have to do with that. So, yeah, very yeah, similar. Mind. The, the, the uh, social distancing, and by the way, I've done a few shows now like this hmm. uh, remotely, and it does bring in, into question whether we always have to be on site and especially in the television industry lighting designers tend to be removed i know there's a few lighting designers that work in television that like to sit out by the board and mm. do it like you know they're doing a tour or something but most of the lighting designers including myself um like to be i like to be in the booth with the director because that eye contact that happens instantly mm -hmm. um, really does help but you know during the pandemic you can't do that anyway but right. uh what we discovered is because we're remote in a truck somewhere not necessarily on stage we come on stage occasionally but mm -hmm. during rehearsal we're mostly removed and isolated is that it's very possible that not all the productions need all of us to travel to do our job. We right. can do it with the right connection. Mm. Um, we can do it remotely. And yep. yeah. Yeah. We've no, that's true. Save time, save, uh, save money, save the stress of all the, all the traveling involved and still and, you'll get the job done. Yeah. And not only done, but meaningful and appropriate mm. and, you know, but, there's one other thing I know I'm going no. on on here. Really, please cut all this stuff. <laughs> um, they, uh, <clears throat> probably one of the proudest moments in my life actually was receiving, as you mentioned, the honorary doctor of fine arts from Carnegie Mellon university. Mm. Um, I had no idea when I went there for the actual ceremony, um, how, what a great honor it was. Okay. Uh, here is the entire class graduating from Carnegie Mellon University. I don't know, 6,000, thousands of graduates mm -hmm. on a football field. And here I am on the dais with two other people mm -hmm. getting these honorary degrees. And I realized this is not something to take lightly. This, this is right. like <laughs> a huge honor. Mm -hmm. that and uh, yeah, it, 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 I'm very proud of the fact that they honored me in that way. Right. Yeah. As you say, given, given to such a few select people that it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Extremely uh, an, an amazing achievement. Yeah. I can understand why you're so proud of that. That's for sure. All right. um, 
obviously, if, if, if we look back, you used to travel, maybe not so much at the moment, but uh, it, it, when you're not, you know, on site with a show or anything and you are, you know, at home, what do you normally do in your downtime? Um, well, during COVID, I watched too much Netflix. I must oh, right. <laughs> Guilty. Yeah, there. Uh, it's fantastic, actually, the quality of television that mm. we're all experiencing right now. But um, <clears throat> I spent so much time inside a dark room. And again, because I work out of the control booth usually, and if I'm not in the control booth, I'm on a stage. It's rather dark, and you know, there's just I spend a lot of time in very dark places. <laughs> right. And uh, so I love to get outside. I, I love hiking. I love you, anything that biking, whatever I can do mm. to just be outside and enjoy the reality of, of the ultimate key light. <laughs> the, right. You know, uh, so yeah, I like to get outside. Right. Enjoy nature at, uh, at its best. Um, uh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's perfect. And that, that, you know, keeps everything in check, gives you a nice balance to, uh, to everything, let yourself reset, ready for yeah. the next, next project. And one other thing I do, which is I'm kind of a weekend warrior. And mm -hmm. I mean that I like doing projects around the houses. I just love getting, you know, doing plumbing or whatever else. I, it, it gives me a sense of satisfaction to accomplish something. Right. Outside of <laughs> I'm completely, completely different from, from lighting a big TV show. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. Um, obviously, you know, as we know, you've, you've worked all around the world and, and with so many of these different shows and so many different venues. Would you say that you've got a particular favorite venue that you've worked in? Um, I'm probably going to repeat what half the people on this uh, series are going to say, but for whatever reason, Radio City Music Hall. Right. There's something about that big barn mm. that iconic in so many ways with this deco um, modern architecture yes uh, that is just so meaningful to me and i actually um my career over the years has always seems to return to radio city music hall for important moments in my career in my early career i got a call to mm -hmm. launch a commercial for the very first rollout of Diet Coke that they were shooting at New York City Music Hall. Right? Wow. So <laughs> uh, here I am lighting the Rockettes um, for this national, and they ran the hell out of that commercial. But um, that, yeah, I, I just enjoy working there. When I first went to Radio City Music Hall, the tradition of lighting designers was to lower in an eyebrow truss to service key light and the like. Okay. Um, and the wide shots that the directors would take would have this big thing going through with a big cable hod going off of it. Huh. And it ruined that gracious statement, visual statement of a ceiling. And so the very first time I went in there, I, um, I thought I'm gonna try to do this without a front light truss. And of course it's heresy. Right. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, I found a way to light anyone that's been in there knows that there's just no lighting positions whatsoever, except for a couple of box booms at ridiculous angles and the follow spot booths. And at the time there were no, there was very little of a balcony rail, mm. but um, I put up these booms on the, um, uh, goalposts on all of the coral steps, they call them, that run up the side of the building. And that's how I lit the audience. I cross lit them. Okay. And it turned out to be this wonderful thing because the cameras were not constantly being blinded by the audience light on the wide shots. And right. the beautiful, gracious ceiling um, was unobstructed. Yeah. So, and I must tell you, mm. the one person that has helped me at Radio City Music Hall is a very good friend and also an amazing theatrical designer, Ken Billington, who was the staff designer at Radio City Music Hall for many years. 
And when I first went in there, he was the one that led me around to the secret locations <laughs> where he blocks and he just helped me enormously. And right. Really Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic guy. Ken, Ken's been one of our previous uh, guests on the series where he's, yeah. I'm going to have to watch the entire series. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can. There we go. Brilliant. No, great shout out. And of course, yeah, I remember Ken, Ken mentions Radio City in his, uh, in his, in his discussion as well. It's, uh, yeah, as you say, an I absolute iconic venue. It yeah. really is. Yeah. Great crew, great venue, great architecture, great, just great everything. Great location. So, yeah. And you can go have a good meal during the lunch hour. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's right in the thick of everything. <laughs> Perfect. Um, now, musically, if if you were to stay, you know, we've we've had various stages of lockdown, uh, uh, obviously coming on and off. Now, if you were subjected to like a long period of lockdown and musically, you could only keep one artist or, or one album with you. Who would that be? Um, now, Having received these questions earlier, I thought this is the most preposterous question. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you quantify what? And, and obviously, like any good lighting designer, I thrive off of music that is dynamic and, and has ample opportunity for cues, mm. great choruses and you know, dynamic bridges and whatever else. Um, and, you know, like Broadway tunes are perfect for that. And also, you know, there's all those rock anthems that we you know, <laughs> just want to light the hell out of that. But um, I tend to be more introspective when I listen to my own stuff. And if okay. I was to say one album that over the decades has uh, comforted me and pleased me, it is Jackson Brown's late for the sky. Okay. Right. right. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. No, a gorgeous piece of work. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Jackson Brown. There you go. Perfect. That's absolutely perfect. Um, if, if you were able to wind the clock back and go and visit the teenage Bob and offer one piece of advice, what would that be? I... I think it's that this too shall pass. Okay. And I, like a lot of people, tend to get obsessed about the moment. Mm. Usually my bad decisions are those emotional moments that um, I'm making decisions without stepping back and really thinking about it and also knowing that this is not the end of the world. And it's not, yeah. So I, um, I think that I would try to counsel Bob, <laughs> the Bob that messed up the mad woman of Shio. Uh, <laughs> this is not the end of the universe. This too shall pass. All right. And, you know, uh, years ago, uh, again, I was doing. A, uh, a production and the director I was working with, which will remain unnamed, mm -hmm. um, was just being horrific towards me. And just, it was so bad that I finally reached a moment where I was quitting, I was gonna give him what for, and I, was at my position and I happened to be in this show, not in the same booth with the director. Mm. I stood up and told him exactly the way I felt and you can just go shove it and find another designer and, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. and nothing came back. And then I realized when I stood up, the headset had yanked out of the jack and it never went <laughs> anywhere. But, uh, <laughs> But if I'd been able to counsel myself, if it had gone, I probably would have damaged my career. But right. the plug came out, and but if I was able to just said, "Calm down, this too shall right. pass." Yeah, uh, whatever. Take a moment. Yeah, regather yourself, and yeah, re reanalyze what's what's going on around you. Yeah, uh, 
sage advice indeed there we go sage advice for anybody watching um if if you were able to sit down for a cup of coffee with uh any one person at all could be could be living or could be past uh who would that be um i thought about this for a while and i was thinking of all the names i could say that are obvious i'm not going to say gandhi or you know <laughs> right <laughs> um they and i'm you, there's just a lot of obvious answers um but someone who moved me with her music and her life story um and I actually have been drawn to because I get solace somehow out of her music was Nina Simone. Okay. She was an American artist who was fed up with the way that black people were being treated and she moved to France and continued her life and career there. Mm. But it, her music really touches me. And so that, that would be, I'd love to know what was the straw that caused her to finally leave her culture of origin mm. go someplace else. Right. Must have been a, yeah, a heavy, heavy decision to have to make for her. She obviously had never heard about this too shall pass, but. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> that would be a fascinating conversation. That really would. Yeah. Yeah. What a great, a great artist indeed. So great character. There we go. Nina Simone, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and so we make it, we've made it to our, our final question. Um, our final question, when we when we're gonna when we finish the interview, you're gonna get a phone call from, from Team USA, uh, not to light the Olympics this time, but to compete. Uh, and so the question is, it could be either for the winter or the summer games, but what's the sport that they're gonna call you up for? What, uh, what have you always fancied having a go at? Um, that is really a tough question because I, I want to, my sport is lighting. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I can contribute. I do know that I enjoy more solitary as opposed to, uh, direct competition, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sports. Um, I'm not a big team sport guy, even though I've done a lot with team sports, but, uh, so, uh, I would say. I just want to get on a cycle and right. just quietly pedal my <laughs> <laughs> pedal around the track. Just keep going and going. Yeah. But that's a great sport to watch as well. See the, uh, the stamina and the, uh, the fitness of those, those athletes. Yeah. Especially when they're not in the stadium, but mm. forcing through a, you know, a track that is in real environments. Yeah. I've always right. gave a tangibility to the, to the Olympics, that and the marathon runners, because so much is, you know, venue centric, mm. where this is, seems to be a more tangible uh, um, sport for uh, the viewer to relate to. I don't know. That's yeah. Funny. No, that's right. A lot of those, it's, it's, it's you against yourself. It's you against the clock or, or, you know, you against a, a target if you're doing archery or something like that. It's, as you say, it's that solitary sport, which are, yeah, yeah. Are fascinating to watch. Yeah. I'm, and there's something about the single achievement as opposed to the team achievement. I'm not saying discrediting that achievement, but hmm. there's something really solitary and I think relatable about you know, a single individual making accomplishing something extraordinary. Right. Yeah. And hopefully getting that gold medal at the end of yeah. it. Yeah. Well, that always is nice. <laughs> so nice little icing on the top of the cake. Oh, yeah. There we go. Um, Bob, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much for finding some time for us to do this. Uh, we know obviously you're 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 busy with with lots of projects. Uh, in the in the the the, the rescheduled uh, COVID awards seasons to, that are going on at the moment, so it's really appreciated that you found some time. Well, you're very welcome, and it is actually easier during COVID to do this kind of thing um, because perhaps in a different time you would have wanted me to drive somewhere or 
and go into a studio to do this. And here we are in Zoom and it seems to be working just fine. And that's it. It's yeah. No need to overcomplicate it. <laughs> but you know, I am about to do the Oscars and um, I am learning a lot about discipline and functionality uh, because we're going to do the Oscars not in a theater with a lot of splash and glamour and smoke and, <laughs> <laughs> right. and um, but instead we're doing it in a train station. It's, um, it's, right. Uh, That's right. In downtown Los Angeles. Yeah. The, uh, the iconic uh, Union train station in mm. Los Angeles. But yeah. It's going to be yeah. fascinating. I think everyone's looking forward to it and seeing seeing what you do and what you what you come up with for, for this year. Don't look for any dynamic like cues. Right. <laughs> it's not <gonna> We're, uh, yeah. It's, but it is a challenge, I will say. I'm sure. There can't be that many hanging positions that, uh, that you can walk straight up to. <laughs> no, no. Right. No it's like, don't touch that, don't touch that, don't, you know, it's so... It's been it's been uh, a very challenging, and it's not been a phone in you know where I can pretty much um, guess how I'm going to design and cue almost any kind of award show, mm. um, and especially one that involves performances like the Grammys. Uh, I can do that with you know in my sleep. Mm. I hate to say it. I don't mean to be arrogant. Maybe I am. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But uh, this is really challenging to try to light people from very few constructed uh, uh, sources that is in largely during daylight. And so, yeah, it's, it's really been challenging for me uh, as a designer. Right. That's, that's great, though. That's great that, that, that you know, you, you get new challenges uh, uh, to, to, yeah, to work on and to, to test yourself with. Awesome. Awesome. Well, good luck with it. We, we all thoroughly look forward to, uh, to watching it when it, uh, when it airs. Uh, again, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, we look forward to obviously meeting up in person when the, uh, when the opportunity arises. But uh, again, thank you very much. And, uh, and we'll see you soon. I look forward to it. Hey, right. Bye-bye.